the fellowship of love. Of all the shameful titles ascribed to our lovely Savior, the most encouraging is this one. He was called the friend of sinners. Surely this description hurled in derision at him must have pleased him immensely, for he came to earth to be just that. Little did his enemies know that they had charged him with the very thing that was dearest to his heart. No better place in this earthly life can this compassion and love of the Savior for sinners be seen than in the lovely story related to us by the evangelist Luke in the seventh chapter of his gospel, verses 33 to 50. Please read it for yourself, and then let me retell this warm, moving experience for your encouragement. Jesus had just concluded a stormy preaching session to the people, and some had believed his word, but the Pharisees and lawyers had rejected the testimony of God against themselves. When it was over, one of them, a man named Simon, insisted that Jesus go home with him to eat. What grace Jesus demonstrated in accepting this invitation offered by his enemy. And while they sat at meat, a woman, unnamed, who was known in the city as a sinner, in the sense of being unchaste, came in unannounced. Without a word, she takes her place at the feet of Jesus and to the shock of Simon, begins to weep openly. And as her tears splash upon the Savior's feet, she kneels and with her long hair wipes them tenderly. Now impulsively she kisses his feet over and over in an overwhelming show of affection. Quickly now she takes a box of alabaster ointment she has brought with her, breaks it, and without a word anoints the feet that soon will be nailed to Calvary's cross for her. When Simon recovered sufficiently from the initial shock of such disgusting conduct, he began to murmur within and accuse the Lord Jesus for allowing her to do what she did. And his reasoning was that if Jesus were truly a prophet of God, he would have known what an unclean sinner woman she really was, since her reputation was known to all in the city. Hence, had he really known who and what she was, he would never have allowed her to touch him. Jesus, reading the innermost thoughts of Simon's heart, answered the charge with a parable. A creditor had two debtors. One owed a small amount, the other a large amount. Neither one could pay, but the creditor frankly and freely forgave them both. Jesus then presses the point. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon, obviously irritated, answers with sarcasm. I suppose he to whom he forgave most. Jesus assures Simon he is correct in his judgment and quickly presses the point of the sword into Simon's heart as he explains. Look at this woman, Simon. I came to your house and you never even offered me water for my feet, but she washed them with her tears. You never offered even to kiss me in greeting on my cheek, but since I arrived she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head, as is the custom due to all, but this dear woman anointed my feet with ointment. You see, Simon, this woman has had much forgiven her. It has resulted in much love for me. I'm sure Simon must have gotten the implication that he possessed no real love for Jesus because he had no realization of sins forgiven. And I trust you'll not forget this illustration, for it clearly shows that our love for Jesus and his personal preciousness to us is in exact proportion to our sense of sins forgiven. But let me speak to you now about the dear woman's relationship with the one true friend she had found in this life. Her reputation in the city may have been bad, her sins may have been known to all, but she had found in Jesus the forgiveness of all. The city couldn't forgive her, Simon wouldn't, but Jesus had freely and frankly forgiven her all. She believed and knew in her heart that in Jesus she had found the one man who could fully accept and love her as she was. Oh, it wasn't the woman Simon saw and knew that Jesus loved, but the little woman inside of her that no man had ever seen but Jesus. 
She had found in him the one man she could fully love with all her heart and in whose blessed presence she could be her real self without the fear of losing his love. How real she is in his presence. She comes to him just as she is, without pretense, without explanation of her actions, and with no embarrassment. By the impulse of her love, she expresses herself without fear or ridicule or rebuke. She's in the presence of her friend, the one who took the time to look beyond the reputation that shamed her and found a woman no one ever understood nor wanted to. Jesus loved this woman. Simon couldn't grasp that, but what Pharisee can? He loved her and forgave her freely, and then went to his death at Calvary to prove to her and Simon the reality of that love. His great love had begotten in her a deep love for him. His love had called from her heart a self-sacrificial love for him, for he had become the most precious person she had ever known. He was the only man she deemed worthy of her most precious possession, the alabaster box of ointment. She had given herself to many men, but none had ever been worthy of the priceless things she had hidden away. Men had used her and abused her, had spoken meaningless words of love to her, but in Jesus she had found a friend who was worthy of the gift she could give only once. She did more than pour ointment that day. She poured herself upon the feet of Jesus. She gave to him what no other person on earth could give him, the unique personal love of her heart for himself. She knew the cost he paid to love her. The loss of esteem he suffered in Simon's eyes told her. Jesus endured the reproach of men for her. His person and his ministry were questioned. He was under continual criticism, accused of ignorance about her, yet without a word to justify himself, he loved her to the end. No amount of pressure by men, demons, or Satan could make him disown her or deny the reality of his love and hers. His death at Calvary was the ultimate cost he paid. She brought him shame and reproach, and for her sake, he was made of no reputation among men. Apart from the personal joy he received in doing that which pleased his father, loving her had also its eternal compensations. She needed him. She never tried to use him. She only loved him. She never asked for anything, only longed to pour out on him what she alone could give. She wept for the joy of her love for him, washed his feet in gratitude with her tears, and wiped him with the symbol of her earthly glory, her hair. She kissed him over and over, anointed him and touched him in real love. She warmed and refreshed him and made the trials of his life and death worthwhile. But if she needed the love and ministry he came to give her, it's equally true that he needed and was pleased by the love and ministry she alone could give to him. The Bible says that God, in order to satisfy his great love wherewith he loved us, sent Jesus Christ to die for us. In eternal ages to come, God will reveal more and more of his grace and kindness to us as the workmanship of his love is seen in us. This unnamed, unworthy, unclean sinner woman will one day be displayed as the masterpiece of God's grace. The only poem he ever composed, the ultimate expression of all he is. While Simon could only see and know the woman he took her to be, Jesus saw and knew the woman his love would create her to be. And his heart and I were on an eternal someday when all creation would see the glory of his love revealed in her. May you enjoy the perfect peace this dear woman knew in his presence. And may his love and friendship be as real to you as it was to her. When men condemn, criticize, and accuse you, when the reputation of your sins and failures hound and plague you, when no man cares for your soul, flee to the arms and presence of Jesus and know you have a friend.